non-relativistic context made the suggestion obscure for particle physicists. But pressure for results on this problem was building within the community. Pressure to overcome the masslessness problem. And this pressure burst through in three different geographical locations. In Belgium, then in Scotland, and then again in England. Volume 13 of Physical Review Letters contains all these papers by Anglair and Braut, on page 271 submitted in June, the June, then by Higgs on page 508, and finally by Kibble, Jerry, and Hayden, submitted in August. Jerry's still wearing the same tie. <laughs> <laughs> the only one I own. In various ways, each paper established that in the presence of long-range forces carried by massless vector mesons, the Goldstone theorem can be evaded, as Anderson suggested the putative Goldstone particle combines with the vector meson and endows it with mass. Higgs's paper is the easiest to follow because in contrast to the other two, his treatment is semi-classical with scant reference to quantum field theory. This explains why the six authors' discoveries are now subsumed under one name, Higgs. But still, the result was not central to the activities of most particle theorists. But two people did pay attention, Salam and Weinberg. <coughs> they were, in fact, co-authors <coughs> with Goldstone on the proof of the Goldstone theorem. So it's natural that they would be interested in the evasion of the result. And both of them, Salam and Weinberg, incorporated the mechanism in previously suggested models of unified electroweak interactions. I remember in my first postdoctoral year, during 1966-67, Weinberg was visiting Cambridge, lecturing on spontaneous symmetry breaking pi mesons, current algebra, etc. One day he stopped by my desk and asked if I knew about the papers that demonstrated evasion of Goldstone's theorem. I did not, and since I was just beginning to learn about Goldstone's theorem, I had no patience about studying its evasion. But sometime later that year, Weinberg stopped by my office again and gave me his unification paper based on the Higgs mechanism. But there was one more wait. While Salam and Weinberg conjectured that the mechanism would control the inconsistencies of massive vector meson theories, it was another four years before Ed Hooft and Veltman proved this. In fact, Veltman told me that Ed Hooft constructed the theory unaware of previous results. So we can add him as the seventh inventor of the Higgs mechanism. Where does the story stand now? No prediction of the standard model has been falsified, but the Higgs particle has not been observed. Theoretical ideas for replacing it with some, something else have not succeeded. So the hope is that the Higgs carries a mass in excess of 120 GeV beyond present available energy, but attainable at CERN at the LHC. Since the raison d'etre for that machine is the discovery of the Higgs, and since the LHC costs in excess of $6 billion, Jerry can be impressed by the fact that his speculations <laughs> led to an international expenditure of a billion dollars. <laughs> <laughs> and what if the LHC does not see the Higgs? Not only Jerry will be disappointed, but such a development will challenge us again to construct new mechanisms for circumventing the Goldstone theorem and generating masses for vector fields. Regardless of its outcome, the Higgs story is interesting 
in that it shows that physics has no room for absolute theorems. If progress is needed, a theorem-justified obstacle is overcome simply by changing the assumptions. The Goldstone theorem does not apply to models with massless vector meson fields. Another example relevant to the extensions of the standard model is the coleman mandula theorem, prohibiting non-trivial mixing of space, time, and internal symmetries. And that result is circumvented by supersymmetry simply by replacing commutators with anti-commutators. <coughs> Another observation is that when it time for a physics idea to, be, uh, to, uh, to germinate, it will come to fruition in more than one location. Let me conclude this appreciation of Jerry by calling attention to his other, now little known, mass-related calculation. In 1967, he published a physical review letter containing a determination of the mass difference between charge and neutral pi mesons. This was volume 18 in 1967. This is interesting because it is the only successful calculation of such a mass difference. Moreover, the research is very much in Jerry's style. There are a total of five authors from three institutions. Das and Matur joining Jerry from Rochester University, Lowe from MIT, and Young from Los Alamos. According to their published statement, the former three and the latter two did the work independently as in the Higgs research, but this time the authors decided to publish together. What is in Jerry's future? A fitting cap, very much in the style of his massive investigations, would be the calculation of the electron muon mass difference. And I hear hints that Jerry has some ideas about this. <laughs> so good luck, Jerry, in answering Robbie's question, who ordered that? Thanks. <laughs> so efficient with timing of the talk. We even have time for some questions. Uh, and, uh, do you have questions? Thank you, <laughs> I just want to know if I have sent you any more correspondence and if you've saved it. <laughs> I save everything. <laughs> I thought I did. I didn't remember that. <laughs> Okay. Thank you. Let's thank the speaker again. Okay. We